always been a family thing. I'm a third generation aviator. My entire family is pilots, including my grandfather, 78 years old, and he's a crop duster in Mississippi. And then my dad, who took me up as a kid and uh, did a lot of flying hours uh, in a crop duster as well as in uh, Learjets and other things. And, uh, so it was pretty much the, the family tradition, and I, I tried to avoid it, but it just kind of sucks you in. And um, it's a lot of fun, and it's my dream job. Couldn't imagine doing anything else. Uh, see, I guess started flying when I was about three years old. I think is when I, my uh, uncle took me up in a little Piper Cub, and that was that was the taste I needed as a little kid. And then uh, my dad was in the military, so growing up, uh, seeing the military planes all around every day, flying overhead, and uh, you know every little kid's dream is to go fly that. And uh, here I am. So it worked out well for me. But. Uh, see, I was, uh, I've been in the military almost, uh, almost 13 years now. I was active duty for uh, about 11 of them, and I've been in the Air Force Reserve for about two years now. Uh, I've been in the Air Force Reserve actually eight years. I'm what they call the baby reservist, so I came straight off the street right into the reserves, and uh, they put me through officer training school into UPT, and then this was my first airplane uh, for the Air Force. As a civilian, my job, I fly uh, 737 NG for Delta Airlines, and uh, I'm based out of New York currently. Uh, my civilian job is I'm a Delta First Officer on the 767 and 757 Extended Range International. In the reserves, you end up applying to multiple different squadrons, and you're always trying to get in with the best guys. And in my opinion, there was no better place to be than flying the KC-10. It's an awesome airplane. They go great places. They, they really go all over the world. They're international capability, and it's a multi-role airplane. And for me, I just couldn't think of any better place to be than flying the KC-10. It's just an awesome airplane. I see. I started flying the KC-10 a little bit, uh, a little bit after I did some other things. I flew the KC-135, which is the smaller version of this airplane, a little bit older. That was my first airplane, and then I moved on. I taught pilot training for a few years, and then uh, after pilot training, after my stint teaching that, I uh, got assigned to fly the KC-10. And uh, such a great airplane and such amazing capabilities that once I got off active duty, I did a few things here and there, and then I decided that I had to come back to it because I just missed it too much. It was just too much fun. You go to pilot training, and you have to go through the selection process, a uh, very competitive process. And then once you uh, enter pilot training, it's 55 weeks long of uh, basic training through advanced training. Uh, in basic training, you fly the uh, T-6 Texan II, which is the newest aircraft in the inventory for our training department. It's an 1,100 horsepower single turboprop aircraft. And then from there, you either fly the T-1 or the T-38. And from there, you finally graduate pilot training, and you are basically qualified in nothing. Uh, and then you get assigned to whatever unit you're going to fly, and it's whatever airplane is assigned there. And it typically takes about six months of training to uh, learn how to be a co-pilot in a heavy aircraft, and then another year or so of seasoning in the right seat, become an aircraft commander. Aero TV is brought to you by Cirrus aircraft have always been easy to fly. Now they're easier than ever to buy. A complete line of ownership programs gives you everything you need to purchase, trade, finance, lease, insure, and warranty your Cirrus. There's even an ownership program for non-pilots. The Cirrus Access Pilot can teach you how to fly or fly the plane for you. Find out more at www.cirrusdesign.com. Cirrus, for the love of flying. The KC-10 is a huge airplane. It's three times the size of a KC-135. We sit very high up off the ground, so you're, you lose a lot of perspective, and you almost feel that you get a loss of speed of how fast you're actually moving across the ground from being so high up. So with being such a big airplane, you really don't know where your tail is, and the wings are wide, and being such a big airplane, you just really have to have good situational awareness on what's going on around you. Are there light poles that you might run into, or is your tail actually clear of the runway so the next guy can come in and land? Because you're sitting way up here in the front, and you forget how far back you are. To get this aircraft in the air, it takes a lot of work, and it, the work really starts with the flight engineer. He uh, calculates all the numbers and makes sure everything's going to that we're going to clear any obstacles on our departure path as well as that the performance that we calculate at our rotate speed is going to be the proper rotate speed so that we, uh, so we actually lift off. So uh, once he calculates the number, we post the numbers on the, uh, on the white bugs on the, uh, on the airspeed indicator. And at that point, we, uh, ask the, uh, we, we get on the runway, set takeoff power, and uh, we pray from there. And at the proper speeds, we toga and rotate, with toga being the takeoff button, sets the command bars in the proper pitch for takeoff. The takeoff speed varies with gross weight. The higher the gross weight, the higher the takeoff speed required to achieve liftoff. 
so it really varies a, a pretty wide range of, for our aircraft. It is a, one of the biggest challenges for reservists, guys like Dan and myself that fly civilian as well for Delta. For me especially, I fly a 737 at Delta and then I come here and I fly the KC-10 and this is a lot bigger, a lot heavier airplane and you flare a lot higher so when you're coming in for your landing, the last thing you want to do is prank it on and drive the mains through the concrete and KC-10 you typically flare anywhere 40 down to 30 feet just depending on your gross weight and the 737 you're flaring a lot lower. So you try to make it smooth and both all you're always asking for that pillow landing and like Dan said you're always praying a little bit for that cush landing. Sometimes it happens, other times it's just a normal landing but last thing you want to do is prank it on either place, Delta passengers or KC-10 because boom operators are your biggest critic. <laughs> Aero TV is brought to you by From the mountains to the prairies. To the landings that we love. Garmin SVT. Synthetic vision technology. Well, the KC-10 has a lot of different missions. We are, like I said earlier, just very, very versatile. Our primary role is for air refueling. We do all NATO nations. We have a lot of capability. We not only have a boom system, we also have a drogue system, which is a basket and hose that is deployed out the back of the aircraft. And that's used for Navy, the Marines, and some British airplanes, as well as other NATO nations. Uh, really our primary focus is, is on air refueling, but we do a lot of airlift support as well where we can use the pallet positions to load up cargo, mission essential cargo. Uh, we can also configure it like we are today in a Delta configuration which holds up to 75 people so we can do an airlift of personnel as well. Uh, and then there's also a special airlift mission as well where we take DVs, generals, secretaries of the state around and take them where they need to go. The biggest thing we have to consider when we go into a refueling mission is uh, the type of aircraft that we're going to refuel and uh, what the mission is. What it, if we're going to take the aircraft somewhere that we're refueling or if we're just meeting up a midpoint somewhere, offloading some gas to them and continuing on. So this departure weather for them as well as departure weather for us is, and en route weather. We have to be able to be visually, we have to see each other to be able to get it together. We'll both show up at the same point at the same time, but if we don't see each other, it really doesn't help out a whole lot. So, you know, the, uh, that kind of weather thing has to come into play for, uh, for us to be able to, to plan that out. And, uh, and again, as well as what happens if our receiver doesn't make the air receiver, you know, doesn't get a, a, a rendezvous with us. Is he going to have to divert? Is he have to going to go somewhere else? And if he is going to have to go somewhere else, uh, you know, do we need to try to go with him somewhere um, to be able to, to help him get in there? Um, some aircraft that we fly for the military don't have uh, very sophisticated uh, uh, landing instruments, so sometimes we have to lead them through the weather and uh, get, them, get them below the weather so they can visually acquire the airfield to land at uh, some places. So it can be a very dynamic uh, in, uh, situation to uh, try to manage all the, uh, all the, all the moving parts. Um, but that's why, we, uh, that's why we have the guys sit in the right seat for a while and kind of learn the ropes um, to get over here to the left seat to make the big decisions. This aircraft uh, for refueling capability is pretty amazing. It, it can really, it can refuel anything in the inventory, either be it our NATO brethren across the way, our Navy, our Marines type aircraft, as well as all the Air Force aircraft. Uh, this aircraft is equipped with a drogue system, uh, with a parachute basket, as well as the boom system. So it's a quite unique aircraft that we're equipped with both at any one time, unlike the KC-135, which is equipped either basket or boom. So they have to actually land and reconfigure the aircraft to make that happen. So. Um, we're, uh, we're called on quite a bit to go out and uh, do, do the mission just because we are so versatile, so whatever shows up we can refuel.